Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Risch. Thoughts on the Roman Epistle, Chapters 1 to 8. By James Boyd. Romans Chapter 4. Is faith then a new principle upon which man is just with God? Was any child of Adam at any time justified by works? Could the flesh ever have boasted in the presence of God? The apostle goes back to Abraham. How was he justified? If by works he might well have boasted, but this cannot be allowed, for no flesh shall boast in his presence. What then says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. However great a personage Abraham was, however God may have been pleased to identify his name with him, and whatever blessing may have been his. He was justified on the same principle as any other poor sinner. The scripture is definite enough upon that point. He had no more to glory in than any other. He was as destitute of works of righteousness as the rest of mankind. This was powerful testimony to a Jew that the flesh counted for nothing in the salvation of a man's soul, and also very humbling to his pride, for he boasted of his descent from this great personage. It was a terrible blow upon the forehead of his boasted lineage from this great man, and biting deep to the brain of all his fleshly pretension, laid him for the moment in the dust. But to quote this testimony with regard to Abraham was not sufficient to settle the question, and prevent it being ever reopened. It might have been replied, and with some appearance of reason, that this was true of Abraham because he lived 430 years before the law was given. But that the giving of the law changed the dealing of God with man, and since that time men have been justified on the principle of works. The apostle therefore chooses another smooth stone from the clear brook of divine truth, and slings it with all his force at the already wounded adversary of the grace of God. What is the testimony of David, who lived in the day when the law was in full vigor? He describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Here is a man justified, but certainly not on the principle of works, for he is a forgiven sinner. He has no works that would justify him, they are all evil works, and cry out for his condemnation. But God shows grace to him, and forgives him. Had his works been good, the righteous God could have done nothing else but justify him he would have been discharging a debt in justifying the man whose works merited it. But here is a sinner forgiven, and accounted righteous. And this was in the dispensation of law. This demolished completely the fort of justification by works of law, which the Jew zealously guarded and caused him hastily to retire into his last stronghold, circumcision. But that a great soldier of the cross pursues him with weapons which were mighty through God to the pulling down of even this stronghold. Was this blessedness confined to the circumcision, or did it reach out to the uncircumcision also? This question is decided by an examination into the justification of Abraham. On the principle of faith righteousness was reckoned to him while he was in uncircumcision, and afterwards he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had being in uncircumcision. That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. This puts the pretensions of the Jew out of court completely. He must come in on the principle of faith, and on the same principle a Gentile may come in also. Circumcision simply meant that, if God justifies a man by faith, that is the end of the flesh before God, it has no standing in his presence. Circumcision is the end of the flesh, it is really what took place at the cross, there it was brought to a complete end in the judgment of God, and circumcision was a figure of this. It was an indication that God could not put himself in relationship with the flesh. If he took up Abraham, and justified him, and placed him in relationship with himself, the mark of death must be in the flesh. It must be set aside. This raises also the question of the inheritance. If they who are of the law be heirs, what about the faith of Abraham, and the promise made to him that he should be the heir of the world? He could not inherit, if the inheritance came on the principle of works of law. And where is the promise of God? Made altogether void, if this is to be accepted. But this is not all, for law works wrath, hence the impossibility of inheriting any blessing under it. Where no law is, there might be inheritance, but not where law is, if law is to have its force. Where no law is there is no transgression, that is, there is no violation of a given commandment, but where law is imposed, the flesh is certain to transgress, and wrath ensue, and to inherit under wrath is impossible. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. Had the promise been by the law neither Abraham nor any of his seed could have inherited it.
but it is of faith that it might be by grace, and therefore sure to all the seed, whether they be Jews or Gentiles. Here we have the light in which God presented himself to Abraham. It is as the God who quickens the dead, and calls those things which be not as though they were. God waited until the fulfillment of the promise was beyond the power of nature, and then said to Abraham, I have made thee a father of many nations, and pointing him to the stars of heaven said to him. So shall thy seed be. Abraham could not count upon himself for the fulfillment of this promise. If this was to be brought about it must be by the quickening power of God, and upon this Abraham counted. Now in the steps of that faith every true child of Abraham has walked ever since that day. It is in this way that God has brought himself before us in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Whatever promises he may have made in the past ages he has been well able to perform. It might have been thought that, as the judgment of God lay upon man on account of sin, and that all were alike guilty, there was no hope for man at all. But we have to learn that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. He is able to relieve the sinner of the righteous judgment that lies upon him. If in the third chapter we see his righteousness declared in the execution of the judgment that pressed upon man on account of sin, so that the offending thing, flesh, has been brought to an end in the execution of that judgment, the blood being the witness to this, in the fourth chapter we see his almighty power put in operation. In bringing from the dead the one who was delivered for our offences, Jesus our Lord raised again for our justification. Thus God brings himself before us, that we may learn him in his righteousness, and in his almighty power, and that we might know that the exercise of these attributes has been in our favour. They might well have been exercised against us, to our eternal destruction, but in grace they have been put forth with a view to our eternal salvation. Blessed be his name for ever and ever. How infinite in wisdom he has shown himself to be. Who could have thought it possible that the creature who had fallen under that judgment, which could not be revoked, would ever have had a way of deliverance opened out to him? And into what heart in the universe would the thought have ever entered that, to the helpless enemy of God, mercy would be shown? But then what creature could have known his creator, if the creator had not declared himself? And yet how easy it is to believe, that he who in the grace of his heart found clothes wherewith to cover the nakedness of our first parents, would provide righteousness for naked sinners. How good, indeed, it is to come to the knowledge of such a creator, and find rest for our weary hearts. By our Lord Jesus Christ the believer is led into all the blessed results that flow from the accomplishment of righteousness, and the putting forth of the power of God to deliver us from the consequences of our sins and give us righteousness in his presence in Christ. Peace with God results from being justified by faith. We no longer dread the judgment to which we were righteously exposed on account of our offences, that judgment having been meted out to our blessed substitute on the cross, who was delivered to bear it. We not only know that we have been forgiven, but we know that we have got a righteous standing in the presence of God, and that he has acted consistently with his nature and character in giving us this standing. We were sinners surely, and our sins have been forgiven us, every one of them according to the omniscience of God, but not only is this true, but he has dealt with them in unsparing judgment. And we know it so that our consciences are set at rest in his presence, we are perfectly assured that they can never come up against us again. They are all gone in the death of Christ, and though he has been raised again, it has been for our justification, there has been no resurrection of our sins. Therefore it is all peace between us and God. And our Lord Jesus Christ delights to lead us into the calm that has resulted from the fact that the storm of divine wrath against sin has spent itself upon his devoted head. And the place which he now occupies can never be visited by a single disturbing element.